Hello, my friends, and welcome to the very first episode of the Estonian Soldier Podcast. My name is Artur Rehi, and I am an Estonian Reserve Soldier. For the very first guest today, we have Jake Bro, a retired United States Air Force captain and a United States nuclear operations officer. Welcome, Jake, to the Estonian Soldier Podcast. Hey, Artur. Uh, thanks you. Thank you so much for having me. Do you want to add anything to that description of yourself? Uh, just for anyone familiar with, um, you know, uh, jobs in the military, uh, I was an officer, uh, held the rank of captain when I got out, and I was a nuclear and missile operations officer. That is correct. Do you want to talk a little bit about your time in the Air Force? What is your standing now with the military? So I commissioned uh, in early 2016, and I went through officer training school at Maxwell Air Force Base. At age 32, I had the brilliant idea to commission as an officer, and to do that, you have to go to Maxwell Air Force Base. Uh, it's a nine-week training course, and then uh, uh, you're good to go. You're, you're a second lieutenant in the Air Force. You already had a degree, so... What was your degree about? I went to the University of Wisconsin-Eau Claire, and I got a Bachelor's of Science in Geology and Political Science. Uh, the, master, the master plan was uh, to go to law school. I did take the LSAT, but I just was kind of feeling burnt out on school at the moment. So I decided to uh, take a year off, and I had a friend who was teaching English in South Korea. And he convinced me on, on the idea of, uh, of going over there and, and teaching English in a public school. I decided to give it a shot. This was 2008. The economy was terrible. The lifestyle changed, the culture, everything about South, South Korea. I absolutely loved it. And I ended up staying there for six years. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. Um, All right. That's uh, a life-changing event. Uh, the casual name for my job title is Missileer. And Absolutely. I'm in charge of the uh, maintenance, security, and operations of the Minuteman Three Intercontinental Ballistic Missile System. That is a lot to say. Yeah. And the Minuteman Three is the land leg of the nuclear triad for the U.S. military. So you have uh, nuclear bombers like the B-52, you have nuclear submarines like the Ohio class, and then you have the land leg, which is the Minuteman Three. At this time, we only have one uh, land uh, ICBM, the Minuteman III. In the past, we've had other, uh, other versions of, of ICBMs like the Titan, Thor, Atlas, and Peacekeeper. The United States Air Force is currently developing the next generation weapon system. The first will go online in probably like six or seven years. Right now, we're but talking about a new missile system. Yes, this is a new oh. next-generation ICBM, Intercontinental oh. Ballistic Missile. At, at present, all we have are the Minuteman 3s, and they've been in operation uh, since, I think, 1973. Uh, so uh, these are very old launch control capsules, very old missile silos. Uh, they've been continuously on alert uh, for almost uh, 50 years now. Is, the, is that an issue, that they're that old and the capsules and all the... Equipment in there is it also fifty years old or as it, it just requires constant maintenance? Like there's yeah. always this rotation occurring of sites being shut down so that things can be uh, you know fixed or upgraded or maintained or cleaned. It is a problem finding spare parts sometimes because the companies that originally made the parts sometimes don't even exist anymore. Yeah. Uh, a, a large purchase order was made in the 1980s for. X amount of this component, and eventually, over 30, 40 years, they just all deteriorate or break, and then you want to get more, and that that company doesn't know how to make it anymore. Everyone who who made it retired. They're you know they're they're not this they're is, not doing the job anymore. This is very strange because it's a half a century ago. This equipment was made around the nuclear missions, and the United States is trying to maintain it. But let's talk about Russia. You know, they also have weapons from the same era. And seeing how they maintain their military equipment in Ukraine, would you think that they would maintain their nuclear missiles as horribly as their BMPs? First, first hand, like seeing how much maintenance is required to keep a launch control capsule and a launch facility operational, I don't know how Russia does it. So, so the speculation is, is that, yeah, they're not doing a good job. Uh, what would the failure rate be? 
for their missiles if they tried to launch everything, and it would probably be pretty high. Definitely some would still go, some probably still work just fine, so you can't you can't really rely on failure, but um, but yeah, I, I, I imagine doors wouldn't open, down stages wouldn't ignite, uh, you know, uh, uh, things would blow up, you know, once it hit atmosphere, it, it would be bad, but... And some of these failures would result in explosions in the silos or next to, in Russia, right? Not necessarily like a nuclear yield explosion, but, oh. uh, you know, the down stages for the missiles, uh, they're highly combustible. They, they, they go boom. If Russia attacks the United States of America, people are talking about it all the time. What would be the first actions in the first minutes if United States detects an incoming Russian missile? That's nuclear Armageddon. That's that's the end of the world. Uh, that's. But I mean more like um, they detect that there has been several launches in the Russian nuclear facilities and they detect some missiles are already in the air and probably they can predict the path of the missiles leading to New York, Los Angeles, whatever cities of the U.S. Who have There's to a push the critical button. decision that the president of the United States has to make at that moment. Uh, there's the president a, makes the decision. The president is the only person who can make the decision. Oh, uh, Okay. So we ha we have civilian control of the United States military, and you know as soon as there's a detection, if the president's asleep or wherever the president is, he's got to get to a secure location. No, no other clear... person can do it. There's the, the information has to travel through the command line to the president and then down well, to the... the the vice president also uh, has a strike officer with him or her at all times in the event oh. that the president uh, is incapacitated or unavailable. Uh, but yeah, that is that is the uh, the normal chain of command. We're talking about twenty some minutes that you have yeah. to get everything done. Yeah. So um, I I was watching an interview with Obama. Right, he was telling that he was sleeping most of the nights. Only like two or three times in his period, they called him with the problems in the middle of the night. He was just sleeping. So the president is asleep. There's already minutes there for him to wake up, minutes going away out of that 20-minute window that is necessary. The, so. the president of the United States, it's the toughest job in the world. Uh, there's, <laughs> there's a good reason why lots of uh, people do not want the job. You know, there's lots of people, they say, why don't you run for president? You'd be a good president. And one, it's the media scrutiny and, and the attacks. But two, yeah, I mean, you're not going to get a good night's sleep for four years or maybe eight years if you're reelected. If you're waking up the president, then something serious has happened. Uh, you know, maybe there was an attack on an embassy o overseas and decisions have to be made about a military response. The chief of staff probably isn't going isn't gonna to do that. So yeah, you'd have to wake up the president at that point. If the missiles would be in the air already and they would you know, fly over the ocean, over the poles. Is over there a Canada? way over? Yeah, just casually going over Canada because they're so nice. They'd see it. Yep. They would be like, "Oh, hey there." Yeah. But is there a way to shoot them down mid-air or intercept them? So the Navy and the Army do have weapon systems to attempt this. What is the success rate of shooting down uh, uh, an, an ICBM? It's not good. When you think about, for example, the Minuteman 3, uh, there are three stages to get the missile off the ground, uh, and then there's another propulsion uh, system to guide it when it's in space. This thing actually goes in space. But at some point, we call it the RV, the re-entry vehicle, it detaches and then it's just a projectile. It's basically a bullet flying through the atmosphere, and it reaches Mach 23. Holy 23, Holy 23 times the speed of sound. What are you this gonna isn't even, even a hypersonic uh, missile. This is what we had in 1973. So the warhead uh, is traveling through the atmosphere at Mach 23. Uh, to Gravity is propelling it. And, I mean, it's going to hit what's going to hit. Can we intercept that? Can we shoot that down? I mean, the United States has been trying to develop that weapon system for 50 years and maybe a coin flip that we could successfully do it. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, the Navy and the army both have weapon systems to attempt to do this. People would be trying, but success rate probably would not be, uh, I mean, you definitely would want to go underground. You, you would want to take shelter uh, in the events uh, and, and not rely on those systems. So if it's up in the air, 
I, mean, I don't know about Russian systems, but what about the U.S. systems? If the missile, for example, if US, USA launches the missile, if it's up in the air, can you still stop it from hitting the target? Can you detonate it in midair, false alarm, something like that? Oh, you're saying, uh, is there like a, uh, a self-destruct system? Yeah, because if the Russia, Russia fires the missiles, USA cannot shoot it down. Is there a way for Russia to stop it before it hits the location? I actually don't know. It, I'm going to go ahead and say no. Uh, it's Russia, uh, no. Russia does not have a self-destruct system on their ICBMs, and neither does the United States. And there was a deliberate decision, like everything as far as, far as the design process, very, very smart people in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s thought about all these questions. And the concern about putting a self-destruct system on a missile is you would then be tempted to use it uh, as a bluff. So, like, if you knew that you could destroy a missile 10 minutes into a launch, like after it's launched, as a threat in anger, maybe, you'd be tempted to launch it, and then you know that you can still destroy it. But then what if that self-destruct system fails? Like, you, you, you were just launching it as a bluff, as a bargaining chip, you meant to have it uh, self-destruct in mid in, in mid flight, and then it couldn't do it. I think that is the reason why they don't even bother with self-destruct systems on ICBMs. So they have uh, analyzed all of this and and made these decisions to protect themselves against themselves or like from themselves. A hundred percent against human I, emotions. I, I can't get into the details of of everything that the engineers and designers put into these weapon systems to make sure they only launch when you want them to launch them, and they don't launch them when you definitely don't want them launching. So there's there's all kinds of fail-safes and redundancies, uh, very impressive engineering. The people that worked on this were true geniuses. Uh, and during the Cold War, there, there was this camaraderie, especially when it came to fail-safe devices. So in order to make these weapons safe for day-to-day -day normal operations, the Soviet scientists and Soviet engineers and American scientists and engineers they, sh they willingly shared information. If you had uh, a design what? schematic in order During to make Cold a weapon... War? Yeah. If, if, you had a if you had a design system, you know, to protect a warhead from not accidentally <clears throat> going critical when you didn't want it to go critical. Let's say... So with, with our warheads, uh, you can dump gasoline on them and then put it on fire. It's not going to go super critical. They're designed that well. So if you have, if you have a, a system that can make it safer, you're not trying to sabotage anything, but you're just trying to make it safer, why would you keep that a secret? Yeah, well, true, because if the enemy has less safer nuclear missiles, it's a threat, it's a threat to you also. So it's, you know, everybody's interest to have as safe missiles as possible. Lot, lots of information was shared uh, willingly by the United States in order to help the Soviets make their systems safer because i mean in the 50s and 60s they had a lot of accidents they had a lot of a lot of uh a, a lot of bad times uh, you can you can google you can google their launch incidents in which everybody attending got got fried and also the uh broken arrow incidents right where some of the missiles in the world are just missing or nuclear warheads as we speak are just missing people People don't know where they are. Have you heard uh, about any of those? All of the concerning incidents uh, with the United States involved the fact that uh, uh, Strategic Air Command, STRATCOM, used to fly bombers around the borders of the Soviet Union 24-7. So in the 1950s, uh, when we had the height of the Red Scare, really, uh, there were strategic bombers with nuclear weapons on board just flying in the air continuously. Uh, so we had uh, air bases uh, wherever we could put them that were storing nuclear weapons. So yeah, Was there it were just a couple... to be always ready to go into the air, airspace? And... So I think a lot of people don't really understand why was there such paranoia? Why was there such concern uh, when World War II ended? And I can perfectly demonstrate to people why. So when World War II ended, uh, when, when, when the Japanese surrendered, because for the United States, that's when the war ended, uh, we, we let all of our veterans go home. We, let, uh, we had about 
10 million United States men serving uh, on active duty, and we reduced that by about 90%. I don't know the exact numbers, but we let them go. We let them uh, go back to their civilian jobs, civilian Mm -hmm. lives. The Soviet Union also had about 10 million people or more serving in their regular military. And when the war ended, they didn't let any of them go. They all Whoa. remained in the military, uh, mostly because they were occupying all of Eastern Europe, uh, installing communist governments uh, in, in, in all of Eastern Europe. Uh, they wanted to maintain their Soviet empire. So if you're the United States and you just reduced your 10 million man World War II army to about 1 million and the Soviets didn't reduce anything, they just pretended like it was still game on. Uh, the communist ideology of the war is not over until communism has uh, spread across the entire globe and capitalism has been defeated. So the United that States said... That is a very good analysis of this. I've never thought about it like that. Yeah. The, the United States said, we're not going to call all these men back. We're not going to lose 25 million people like the Soviet Union did. Our deterrence is nuclear weapons. To stop the Soviet Red Army from marching west to Paris and Barcelona and Lisbon uh, because their ideology openly preached that they were going to spread communism around the globe in order to achieve global peace. So you'll notice they had B-52s just flying all over Soviet airspace. But in this light, where does the Korean War and the Vietnam War stand? I mean, at that time, were they still flying bombers? The bombers stopped flying once we felt like we had an effective deterrence with our ICBM force. Oh, so as we kept yeah. creating more long-range intercontinental ballistic missile systems, we said, I don't, I, I don't think we need as many planes circling by, but we always had strategic bombers stationed somewhere that could respond to a Soviet threat. With the Korean War, Uh, That started in 1950. That's because administrative control was divided between the Soviets getting the north part of the the peninsula and the Americans getting the south part. They created two different governments, obviously based on different ideologies. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Soviets and, and the Chinese were in favor of the peninsula being communist. So they were supplying uh, equipment. They were supplying weapons to the North Koreans. I don't think the United States or the South Koreans would have initiated a war, but to uh, Kim Il-sun, the grand, the grandfather of Kim Jong-un, he just decided to go for it. He decided to gamble everything to reunify the peninsula. And the only I, reason I re- why... I recently watched a video, and actually Johnny Harris's video, of course, that's how I educate myself on history, but uh, apparently the Soviet Union just got a nuclear... Uh, test done and then Stalin sent a message to him that go ahead with the invasion to Kim Il-sung. So I think, yeah, I think the Soviet Union's first successful nuclear test was 1949. Just uh, before So the United the States had it in 1945 and there was this brief four-year period where we were yeah. the only country that had it. And then as soon as the Soviets got the bomb, they said, let's be, let's be a little bit more ambitious here. It's like the Korean Peninsula, right? The only reason why the United States was able to get involved, I mean, they could have done whatever they wanted, but they actually got UN Security Council approval to militarily intervene. The United States gave the UN Security Council seat to Taiwan. Uh, The Chinese had a civil war after World War II, and the communists won, and the nationalists retreated to the island of Taiwan. Yeah. And the United States in 1949 was recognizing Taiwan as the legitimate con- uh, government of all of China, even though they only controlled 2% of the, of the territory. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so because the United States gave the Security Council seat to Taiwan, the Soviet Union was boycotting the U- United Nations. So oh. when North Korea attacked South Korea... There was nobody on the UN Security Council vote to veto uh, an intervention. Like Russia is doing so- now with you know, Ukraine, every decision with Ukraine. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Uh, so because the Soviet Union was, was dumb and, and they were boycotting the UN, the UN approved military action. And then there was this 
coalition of allied nations that rushed onto the peninsula. There was the Incheon landing. Uh, they turned the tide of war. The North Koreans got annihilated. Uh, they pushed them all the way back to the Chinese border. Yeah, but then it, China got involved, right? Yes, then China got involved, and that's when millions of people started dying. Uh, you know, like like uh, three million three million Koreans, I think, died in, in that civil war. It was it was very brutal. Insane, yeah. Every everything on the peninsula was destroyed. When I was living in South Korea, you know, I would visit these historical sites, like these temples and these monasteries, and they all said rebuilt in 1954. Yeah, the bombing campaigns took everything down. Like they they firebombed also back then, right? Everything everything was destroyed. Like every building, every structure, it was bad. But how are like South Koreans living living with this threat every day? You know, people ask me as an Estonian. Also, I'm so used to living next to Russia, and sometimes people from America say, "Oh, the, are you so ready to go to war every second? How are South Koreans with this? They don't talk about it. Like but, it's that uncomfortable member of your family that keeps screwing up and when you get together at thanksgiving or christmas or whatever you just don't talk about it uh, <laughs> that's a coping so mechanism when, so when i was living in south korea you know the expat community foreigners i was i was in uh i was in south korea when kim jong-un died uh no kim kim jong-il yeah. kim jong-un's father so yeah. Kim Jong-il died in 2010, and Kim Jong-un, at age 29 or whatever, became dictator for life of this, uh, of this country. And yeah, it was kind of a big news story. And for the most part, <clears throat> South Koreans just don't want to talk about it. You know, when North Korea does a nuclear test or they do provocations, they've been putting up with it for 70 years. For 70 years, uh, it's been these provocations and and just weird story after weird story to the point where they just say we're gonna continue living our lives life just kind of learn, learn to ignore it i guess i mean otherwise you cannot live and they have moved on looking at the economy i mean they're doing good it's a coping mechanism i, I think south korea yeah south korea is like the 12th or 13th largest economy in the world yeah. considering their population size of about 50 million that's fantastic uh, the standard of living in South Korea was amazing. Uh, I, I highly recommend it if you ever want to travel to Asia. Definitely stop in Seoul and, and, and check out the sites. But how, how do they, since USA troops have been there for almost half a century now, how did they uh, react to you as, a, as an American? How, what is their attitude towards Americans? With these military bases like in Japan or in South Korea, there's always the incidents of... You know, in younger service members, a lot of people who join the military are 18, 19, 20, and they're not the brightest individuals. So there might be incidents with drinking or maybe getting into fights. Uh, I, I think leadership does their best to stop young, immature people from doing stupid things while stationed in someone else's country. So there have been incidences uh, where South Korea has been very upset and offended and horrified at what service members have done. But for the most part, overall, they've been incredibly grateful uh, for the security guarantee and the protection that they've received from the United States for 70 years. Okay. If the United States military was not permanently in South Korea these last 70 years, the North 100% would have attacked them and invaded them again. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. I think it's the same with the Baltics and maybe even Poland. If if not for NATO or the EU, I think Russia would have used the opportunity already, it's thanks to the projection of, of power. An interesting geopolitical point about North and South Korea. What keeps North Korea going? It's not a very successful government, country, or economy. And the only thing that keeps North Korea going is China. China is yeah. the only country that provides them with food assistance and economic assistance. Because they don't produce almost anything as much as they need it, North Korea, I mean. I mean, North Korea, I mean, their economy, their economy remains standing mostly because of uh, counterfeiting money and uh, kidnapping people. And they, they export about... labor to Russia. Like, there's... 
there are North Korean slaves, basically, that have been uh, loaned out to Russia to work uh, in, in timber forests, cutting Oof. down trees and stuff. It's, it's slave labor, but that money goes to the Kim family. There also is a little bit of fishing. They do some fishing and they export that to China. But the Chinese economy, I mean, the, the North Korean economy is terrible. And the only reason why they, the Kim family stays in power and, and the government doesn't collapse is because of China. Because China does not want, uh, China wants a buffer state. North yeah. Korea, that's all they are. They're just a buffer between the United States military and South Korea and the Chinese. If North Korea collapsed and Korea reunified as one country, one, interestingly, they'd have the largest military in the world if that happened. I mean, if, 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 if everyone in the North Korean military stayed in the military and they merged with the South, uh, the Korean Peninsula would be a serious uh, economic and military power in the world. But And China well, would like, suddenly have to deploy like 100,000 troops on the border, right? I, I don't I, – that's not the concern. I think the concern China has is that the United States would seize on the opportunity to immediately start building military bases on the Korean-Chinese border now. Which I think they would, <laughs> I think. I, I think the world has changed a lot this year. My perspective, I served for six years and I questioned why, why do we do this? Why do we do all this as, as Americans to deter Russia and deter China? My attitude is they're never going to do anything. My attitude, if you ask Jake from 2020, I don't think anything's going to happen. These Minuteman 3 missiles have been on alert for 50 years and we've never launched one. Why are we doing this? And uh, then Russia invaded Ukraine. Everybody my attitude thought... was everyone in Russia in, in power is getting rich. Don't they have enough? Everyone in Beijing, everyone in China is getting rich. Don't they have enough? And 2022 is the year that proved me wrong because apparently Putin, being the richest man in the world, because he's been stealing the wealth from the Russian people and the Russian government for, for 20 years, the, it wasn't enough for the dude. Uh, you're I, not alone. The entire European Union, I think only the countries bordering Russia saw Russia what for what it was. Finland, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, but Spain, Germany, France, nobody. They... They looked uh, down at the politics like these claffing small dogs, you know, Pomeranians, like always very annoying and spastic, talking about how Russia is doing these horrible things. And Russia is fine. I mean, we're buying gas and cheap, cheap gas and everything. So the entire European Union was blindfolded, I think, for 30 years. I was always skeptical, but I, I, I still don't get it. I, I still think that things were going very well for Putin and for the oligarchs. Why did they have to do this? What, what, what? We now know. So in my last podcast, I had the uh, Danish naval officer Anders Puck Nielsen on, and I asked him the question, what's the number one reason why Putin invaded Ukraine? And he, he had the best answer. And he said the number one reason why Putin invaded Ukraine is because he thought it would be easy. Deterrence failed. Uh, yeah, Putin, and there was no deterrence in Ukraine. Well, the, the deterrence maybe was economic that, you know, hey, Russia, if you invade Ukraine, uh, we're going to put more sanctions on you. Your economy is going to get worse, blah, blah, blah. But the thing but is, Russia, Putin, regular Russian person never had anything anyway. There's nothing to lose there. Only Moscow and St. Petersburg have physical things. People have things. People don't have washing machines in Siberia. Yeah. other side of the Urals. So there's nothing to lose economy-wise. Well, it's it's not the average Russian person making these decisions. It's just the elites no. in Moscow. So uh, deterrence didn't fail for the, the, the poor Siberian who doesn't have a washing machine. Deterrence failed for Putin. But uh, they, they are not losing. Putin personally is not losing anything. I think Putin is losing a lot. If, if you want to count dollars or rubles, <laughs> I think Putin has also... Uh, I don't think the guy sleeps well at night now because his grip on power has that to be loosening. Uh, yeah, you know, all the diseases he might have, nobody knows. But looking at his face, it's, it's swollen up and everything. There's something wrong with him in the last six I, months. I'm going to continue making the economic argument on my channel that 
Russia is heading towards an economic collapse, which will lead yeah. to a civil war. I think this is 1991 all over again, and the modern state of Russia might not exist in two or three years. In 91, it, the power change happened, though, without firing a single shot. The tanks thought, went to Moscow, but they didn't fire. I mean, Yeltsin was just proclaimed as the president, and it could happen, like civil war, I mean full-out conflict, it could happen, just the military goes into Moscow and the power is, has so, changed. So let's say that, you know, somebody gets rid of Katerov and, and, and a true Chechen says, uh, you know, I'm I'm a Chechen leader for Chechnya and we're declaring independence again. Yeah, Dagestan declares their independence. You've yeah. got some faction in Siberia that declares independence. Tuva Republic. <laughs> Who's going to stop them? The Russian military? What Russian military? Yeah, it's been destroyed. Ukraine. Ukraine destroyed it. Uh, if, if these regions or provinces want to break away, they would nationalize all of the military assets in their territory. That would become their equipment. And what's Russia going to do? Uh, this 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 idea of a pan-Russian identity across Asia doesn't. It's not real. No, uh, no. There's the many different cultures and republics. And uh, just today, I reacted to a video of of mobilized troops in Tuva Republic, which is next to Mongolia, but part of Russia, uh, revolting, actually. A battalion-sized group of men were standing together saying that they will mutiny against this law and they will not go to war, so they could break away. But Moscow's, Moscow's uh, method for maintaining control over this diverse empire is Russification. They say, hey, yeah. you speak Russian, you're Russian. You're a member of the Russian Eastern Orthodox Church? Congrats, you're Russian. We're in charge of you. But just because you speak the same language or are the same religion doesn't mean you need to be the same country. How many countries in the Middle East and North Africa speak Arabic and they're all Sunni, Sunni Islamic, but they're all different countries? Algeria and, wars and with Tunisia and Egypt... I think something similar is going to happen across what today is the Russian Federation. Yes, they'll all speak Russian. Yes, they'll all be members of the Russian East Eastern Orthodox Church if they don't all break up. But I think nationalities, countries, uh, we're going to end up with some new countries when this is all over with. Yeah, and, and talking about if Russia would send some troops to stop this breaking away i mean the first chechen war was 1996 right russia had still troops from the soviet union from 91 and they couldn't win this war against chechnya i mean Chech chechnya won the first war the 90s were not a good time for russia i think i think that's partly why putin has experienced such success there was so much chaos from collectivization to privatization and so much corruption mm -hmm. that when putin came to power and things just started getting better, as they inevitably probably would have. He took all the credit. The people gave him all the credit. And 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 the average Russian, up until this year, might have been scared to try someone different. Because they're remembering the pain of losing their empire and uh, the economic crisis of the 90s. Putin used that to his advantage. He played on that. I don't know. I, I I hope the average Russian has a different opinion and they're willing to try a different political leader uh, going forward in the future. Um, I'm not so sure about that. I mean, Putin has been brainwashing for 25, 20 years, something like that. And the Russian state of mind is always about the Tsar. It's more important than the family member. I mean, they would sacrifice, some of the families would sacrifice their sons and daughters just to keep the Tsar. It's the status quo. I mean, it's it's like the promise of stability if we have this my, one strong My leader. counter to that would be 1917. But then they, people they murdered, were starving. They murdered the Romanovs. There was a revolution. Uh, yeah, but people so, had been starving for years. And things and have to get in worse in Russia. Yeah, true, true. I mean, where we are today, I, I, I go on YouTube, I watch these... Let's check out my local supermarket videos. You know, I, I'm curious, what is life like in Russia? And just from what I'm seeing, it's it's not that bad. Like, yeah, I mean, it can get yeah, worse. There is plenty of food. Food prices have raised about 100%, but in 1917, they raised about 
two, three thousand percent. I mean, there's a lot more to go to that. And Russia produces a lot of food. So if people don't starve, I've, knowing Russian mentality, I don't see them going violent against the power. E- economically, we're not there yet, but let's 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 check back in in another six months. I think oh, yeah. we'll be closer, closer to something devastating. Yeah, it's true. I mean, First World War was a big part in the 1917 revolution, and it has to go on for years for it to have any effect back then also. So yeah, in maybe one or two years, people would be much worse, and then they would think differently about Putin. There's going to be some economic shocks coming. The Federal Reserve here in the United States is meeting again the first week in November. They're going to raise interest another 75 basis points. I even see it here in America. Like, people don't understand what's coming. In general, people kind of stray away from math. They get uncomfortable when they start talking about percentages and interest rates. They don't really understand, like, the impact. But here in the United States... Uh, next year, to get a, a home loan, to get a mortgage, it's going to cost you 9%. That is... 9% interest? Sure, yes. Uh, just just a year ago, it was 3%. You know, if you were getting a 30-year fixed-rate mortgage on a home, you were getting insanely low interest rates. I don't see if anybody it, buying a home with that. Uh, the housing market uh, is buckling. My neighbor next door, they put their house on the market in June... And it still hasn't sold. It's been it's been four or five months, and it's still on the market. It's and the, same here. the only way people can afford the mortgage payment is if the price comes down. And if the price comes down lower than what people paid for it, and they need to get out of their mortgage, they're just going to start walking away from their homes. This is what they did in two thousand eight. So in two thousand eight, two thousand nine. Uh, the the peak of the financial crisis here in the United States was was 2010, and something insane like one in three mortgages we say underwater, meaning the value of the home is less than what you owe on the mortgage. So financially, every time it makes sense just to walk away from it and let the bank foreclose and reclaim it. Yeah, uh, this is what was causing the cascade failure that caused the financial crisis, which caused the banks to go bankrupt. And even though we're technically in a recession, nothing bad has really happened yet. There's been no Fortune 500 companies declaring bankruptcy, wipe, wiping out shareholder value. Like, nothing bad has happened yet, but, I mean, which means so it has little, to get worse. <laughs> yeah, a lot So worse. Once, once the dominoes start falling in, in Europe, in the EU, in the United States, it's going to affect China. And then it's going to hit Russia the hardest because Russia, because of all of these sanctions, has no way of mitigating the problems. In an economic slowdown, that's when you go to the international bond markets. You borrow money in order to mm-hmm. keep essential services for your government going. I mean, the EU Russia as a financial system is bringing up the slower countries and bringing down the fast, it's just keeping everything together like a one big system. Russia doesn't have anybody, only China, maybe. Russia is already running a deficit. Uh, so they're from, they're spending more month, every month yeah. than they're bringing in in tax revenue. And, and this that, that, gap is going to get wider and wider. Yeah. And because they, they can't issue debts, no government is going to loan them money. The only thing they can do is print. And <laughs> once you print money, you've basically given up. Yeah, yeah. I know in the United States, we say, we say what the Fed does buying U.S. treasuries is, is printing money. Mm-hmm, but in yeah. Russia, they're actually going to have like the money printer go burr uh, to keep paying for all their secret police and FSB and all that stuff. And it takes about a year or two for that inflation to really kick in, right? It doesn't happen in months. It takes some time. It, it, the process has already begun. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, let's let's keep checking in every three months, every quarter. Let's see what kind of data and information we can get out. But nothing is going to get better for Russia. Yeah, I don't see it also. And the Western powers have also stated if Putin goes but nothing changes, then the sanctions will remain in place. It's, it's not about Putin. It's about Russia as an as imperialistic state. The list of things that a replacement government would have to do if Putin was just magically removed... Yeah. For sanctions to be lifted, it, it's long. Yeah. The, the things that they would have to do to to get out of this, it's long. Even, uh, and even I, paying war reparations to Ukraine, we're talking about hundreds of mil, 
billions of USD. I mean, they don't have that money. If they would start paying, they would keep paying for 100 and, years. And how do you even trust any kind of agreement? Let's say a new government, some FSB guy yeah. offs Putin and takes power. There's plenty of those. And then he's yeah. willing to just say anything. Yeah, I'll, I'll pay reparations. Uh, just get these sanctions off me so I can start bringing in money. As soon as the sanctions are gone, he, he reneges on the deal. He says, Ukraine did something bad. We're not going to pay those reparations now. Like, oh. what's the enforcement mechanism to make the new government actually comply if it's basically the same people? You know, it's the FSB running the country. It's, it's not a true democracy. You can't trust what they say. Yeah, but I think one of the things would be cutting Russia into pieces. I'm not The Western powers cannot do it, but it needs to happen inside Russia. So 100%, different. yeah. There should be yeah. no military action. China might do something, but yeah, uh, they as want far Siberia. As, yeah. Well, they want outer Manchuria back. Mm -hmm. uh, this and there's is territory a, a lot of that, resources there also. Yep, them. there's uh, there's those islands. The I forget the name, but yeah, there there is untapped oil oil deposits, uh, and it would also give China uh, clear access to the Pacific Ocean, so they don't have to sail through Korean and Japanese uh, and Taiwanese water. But there's a, there's a long list why China would want that territory back. Uh, so Russia, Russia, Russia better be careful. And for the same reasons, people say uh, China and Russia, their best is now. No, no way. China's playing such a double game. I mean, most of their exports go to the USA. I don't think they would do anything to threaten that money that comes from the United States to China every year. I'm, I'm glad China is acting in their own self-interest. Like, it would be stupid yeah. of them to militarily help Russia. Yeah, that would yeah, be... Yeah, I'm, I, I mean, I, I, I've been very careful on my channel not to be critical of, of the Chinese because it could be worse. <laughs> they could be doing a lot more to be helping Russia, and they're choosing oh, yeah. not to. So thank you, China. Yeah. Yeah, they're just like officially on the cameras, like playing this game, all oh, Russia and China, inseparable, the meetings and all of that, but no actions follow these words, nothing. So. Russia has exposed itself. They they talked a big game, and I think China used to look up to them, but I think China now is saying, "I guess we're on our own." You know, it's yeah. it's uh, if we want to we want to be interventionists, it, and I and I think this is coming. I think the Chinese military is going to take action somewhere, not Taiwan. necessarily Taiwan, but no. but Central Asia or maybe the Middle East is is, is now in play for them. If they want to have some kind of limited military action to stabilize and bring peace to the region, if if Moscow's power and, and influence declines in the Middle East and Central Asia... There's a vacuum. Somebody has to take that place. China sees it as their opportunity. Uh, yeah. Chinese money is already flowing into these former Soviet republics in, in Central Asia. Mm -hmm. And if Chinese businesses are invested in Turkmenistan and Taj 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 Tajikistan... If these countries start fighting with each other, then China says, we have to protect our business interests. We're going to send our military in to resolve disputes. That is exactly what Russia was doing with the Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, you know, deporting Estonians, putting Russians in their place so they would in the future have the opportunity to protect those Russians in, in foreign lands. China is now a regional hegemon in, in Central yeah. Asia and the Middle East. And and as Russia declines, China China should be rising, but it's up to them there how they India, manage There is India, of course. We're not talking about India. The yeah, we don't rival. talk a lot about India, but in general, power. India should be a democracy. They are a democracy. And I'll, I'll just refrain from commenting. I honestly don't know enough about internal Indian politics and, and the strength of the Indian military. What would, what would you think? We talked about how Russia has played itself in the corner and everything like that. What, what can Putin do? What are his options? I don't see... All of the Trump cards are out. It's not... No jokers. If I was Putin, best case scenario, I would just retreat, retreat all of my military forces back to Crimea and just try and hold that. Give up on the Donbass, go to the negotiating table, signal to everyone in NATO, I want out of this. Let me pull everything back to Crimea, go to Crimea, uh, screw Donbass, uh, and then just try and hold that. Get back to where you were in 2014. I think that's his best case scenario at this point. But no way in hell that's going to happen. <laughs> I don't. I don't think, I don't so. think Ukraine's going to stop. Why would they yeah. stop no. after they everything could, Russia's take... done to them? I mean, they're, uh, they're committed. 
the soldiers are in 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 uniform. They, I mean, they have the, they have the experience and the training. The potential They're going to keep going until the job is the done. Gun. Yeah. And if USA money keeps flowing into Ukraine and weaponry, I mean, that's only speeding up the process of Ukrainian victory. I don't see them stopping. And USA doesn't seem to want them to stop. The, the United States wants to prevent nuclear war. And I think we do need to pause and just congratulate ourselves. Hey, we've made it eight months without triggering a nuclear war. So I think there are some very yep. smart people who have put a lot of thought into this and They've been deliberately taking actions uh, from the United States to not trigger the use of nuclear weapons by Russia. Yes, because so, all, all of the weapons sent are also very small steps involvement from the last package. There's no 300-mile range attack MS sent immediately. This is just very slow involvement. To the Ukrainians, uh, this is win or die. There is no lose. Yeah. Uh, so they'll do anything to win. I, I believe that. And and they should. It, it's a struggle for their existence. It's a struggle for their national identity. Uh, the the crimes that Russia has committed, they deserve it. They have it coming. Mm -hmm. But for the United States, they do have to uh, emotionally detach themselves, uh, zoom out, get the uh, get the full picture, and say, "Oh yeah, there's this thing called nuclear Armageddon, and we need to prevent this." <laughs> So there's all there's all these decisions happening and, and and yeah, we want Ukraine to win, but we need Russia to kind of still think they can win, so they yeah. don't resort to their nuclear stockpile. It's uh, a very so Russia thin is losing, red line, and, I, and yeah. I'm gonna argue Russia will lose, but we can't we can't make them think they're gonna lose tomorrow. <laughs> That's such a mind game from the USA, like to make the enemy feel like they are winning. By, but they're still not not they're winning, but that they still can win. Hope is a dangerous thing, yeah. Hope is keeping them going to the point where, yeah, everything falls apart, and then, and then the moment will seize itself at some point. Yeah, and let's hope at that moment nobody presses that button from Kremlin. But Jake, this episode has been very, very enjoyable, and I really enjoyed talking to you. Uh, mostly, I didn't. <laughs> Ask the questions I have written down, but I think our conversation turned out more natural this way anyway. Everybody who is viewing Jake's channel is in the description below. Go and subscribe to his channel also. He makes really cool videos about Ukrainian war updates about the situation in Ukraine. Uh, Jake, would you like to add something in the end? Uh, glory to the heroes, glory to Ukraine. I hope they continue kicking ass. Well said, well said. My friends, thank you for watching the Estonian Soldier podcast. Sub subscribe to this channel also, so you'll be notified when the next podcast will be uploaded. All right, take care, everyone.